In this video, we are watching the students from the other class. We are picking up at the end of the discussion of the revised models of the Van de Graaff machine and pie pans. The students in this class have been working with the same curriculum, observing the same phenomenon, and collecting evidence about those phenomenon. In this video, you'll see how the remaining questions from the revised models were used as a transition into the next topic. This way, even though we are moving into a new topic, the two topics are connected together to tell an overarching story about the phenomenon. So it looks like if we think back to our first models we drew where we had lots of differences, some had a positive Van de Graaff machine, some had a negative Van de Graaff machine, some had, remember, we had some of them starting charged, the Van de Graaff was charged and the pie pans were neutral. We had that debate about whether the Van de Graaff starts as neutral or not. So it looks like we've answered a lot of those questions and come to kind of a consensus on what's happening with the Van de Graaff. Do we know where this negative charge is coming from? So we know it, when we plug it in, the Van de Graaff becomes negative. Do we know where that negative is coming from in the first place? Yeah. Is it like in like the middle section? Is it in like, like a band that when you plug it in, it starts to uh, uh, circulating the section and charging the metal part above it? Okay, so we have this band in the middle, and when we turn it on, it circles around, creating friction. But why would friction create a charge? Because it's like when you pull the tape off or when you pull the saran wrap off the roll, and it like rubs. So we, we know that, we've seen that in several examples. Do we know where, why friction creates a charge though? For the same reason that you get a charge when you rub the fur on the balloon. It's okay. just two different materials that happen to charge each other when they're rubbed. <laughs> so we've see, again seen lots of examples. Where's the charge coming from though? What is the charge? How about why would a neutral object be attracted to both positively and negatively charged objects? Question. If it doesn't have a charge, why would it be attracted to it? Because it wants a charge? Okay, true enough. It's how it works. We know that's how it works because we've seen it. But can we explain that part of it yet? Yeah, Colin? So the electric field is with the charged objects. Okay. So when you place a neutral by it, even though the neutral doesn't have the field, the charged object does, and so they interact. Okay. But why would the neutral object interact with the electric field, though? Because the electric field likes the neutral object, and they're good friends. Okay, <laughs> they're good friends. They go way back. We know that different materials, when we rub them together, we get a charge. And we know that neutral objects are attracted to positively and negatively charged objects. So we know neutral objects are impacted by the field, the electric field of a charged object. In order to give a more detailed explanation, though, I think we're going to have to investigate uh, what materials are made of and why we would get a charge when we rub different materials together. I start a new topic by eliciting students' prior ideas about that topic. Here I am asking students ideas about atoms. However, I know that students have been introduced to the term atom in middle school, and oftentimes students memorize a definition for a term without really being able to use that to explain their observations. Therefore, in this initial discussion, I worked hard to elicit students' ideas of atoms without using the actual term atom. In order to be able to explain why friction with different materials gives us a charge, I think we're going to have to start to investigate what are those different materials and figure out what are the materials made out of and why would we get a charge when they rub together. So our investigation five, we're going to start looking at what are materials made out of. So to start our investigation of this, we're going to go back to a debate from ancient Greece. And the debate was basically, so if I take a piece of paper and I cut it in half, what do I get? I get two half sheets of paper. And I can cut it again, and I get a quarter. 
And I cut it again. Fourth. Eighth. Sixteenth. All right, and I could keep going, and I keep getting smaller and smaller pieces of paper. So the question is, theoretically, now I know eventually I'll get a piece of paper that's so small, like I'll cut my finger instead of cutting the paper. But theoretically, could I keep cutting and getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of paper? Or at some point, would I hit something that's no longer paper and it's something else? It's something that paper is made of. So that's the question. And do you think I could continue cutting and I just keep getting smaller and smaller pieces of paper? Or at some point, would I get stuck? With that question out there, students discussed their initial ideas with their partner and recorded their own thoughts. They then were asked to evaluate some sample student responses. These responses were written to sound like something students might say, and again, were intended to get students to talk about their ideas while continuing to avoid the term Adam. After students discussed their own ideas and the sample student responses, we then had a whole class discussion. So what students did you guys think had the best, best responses? Yeah, Charlie? Um, I believe that OK. So what do you like about their answers? Um, well, we, um, both B and B and me, um, we all shared the same idea and thought process of this. Is that if you could theoretically just keep cutting it up, it would no longer be paper, but what paper is made of. Like one of them said wood, one of them said dust. So it would eventually just turn into the atoms that make up what paper is made of. So you used a new term there, atoms. What do you mean, what, do, what does that word mean to you? Atoms to me mean like teeny tiny particles that make up everything in life. It's like you're made of atoms, I'm made of atoms, the table is, whether you have life or you don't have life, you're made of atoms. Okay. So every single object in the entire universe made of atoms. And so you like B B and D with the thought that eventually you would get to the stuff that makes up all this stuff which you're calling atoms? Yes, yeah, since this is called a paper, it's not an atom, then I'm going to cut that Okay. All right. Any, any other? Yeah, Hannah? Well, I think if you have the right equipment, you just keep cutting something forever, and it's never going to change, because it will always just be paper, because it's paper. And it doesn't matter if you cut it up into little pieces. It's still be paper. Still paper? So which student do you think had the most reasonable? Which one did you answer? Student A. Student A? You disagreed with her? She is the one typing. I have to agree. It's okay. Oh, you agree? Okay. All right. But you guys disagree with Charlie. You're saying it's still paper. You can't change that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, Milam? I think, well, if you do other equipment, if you keep cutting it, eventually you're going to cut down to one single atom. And since paper is made up of a mixture of atoms, then you're eventually just going to get one atom. And that's not paper anymore because it's only one part of paper. Okay. Multiple parts to make one whole. Okay. And yeah, so we've got some are saying no, it'd still be paper, and some are saying no, we'd get to these things that we're calling atoms, that are the parts of paper, but not you'd need to put them all together to get paper. Any other ideas, or do the rest of you kind of either align with Charlie and Milam or Hannah and Emma? No other ideas? Okay. After discussing their initial ideas, students were introduced to competing views on the nature of matter. One was the particle nature of matter, the idea that all materials are made out of small particles which are grouped together to give that material its appearance and properties. The other idea is the continuous nature of matter view, the idea that materials will continue to have the same appearance and property no matter how small the level you get to. In order to evaluate their initial idea, in these two competing views on the nature of matter, students collected evidence from several different labs. In the next video, you'll see one of the labs the students did, as well as the discussion of the data students gathered from that lab.